this channel I am starting today playlist of some important Indian mythological stories which give great learnings. The first virtue or the first yama, a rule for any yogi mentioned by Maharshi Patanjali is truth, satya. Today's story is of King Harishchandra who is known for truth. Harishchandra was a great king and he was as virtuous as he was wise. He was as strong as he was handsome. He was merciless, ruthless and powerful when protecting the weak and the infirm and the old. He was compassionate and caring when dispensing justice. Amongst scholars and wise men, he was humble and among children, he was playful. His wife, Shaifia, she too was as virtuous as he was and as handsome as he was, she was as beautiful. As they had and they had a child, Rohit had a prince. Although he was just a young boy, the mark of greatness was already upon him. So it was that Harishchandra, the Lord Emperor of the Earth, and Shaivya, the Queen, and Rohit, the Prince, ruled the Earth righteously. It was a time because of the harmony of their rule, there were no famines, diseases, or untimely death. People glorified God through their lives and satisfied their karmas appropriately. One day, Harishchandra is out outside of his capital city. There is a great dark forest and he is out. He is chasing a wild boar through the forest. The, the wild boar had come into the villages and was terrorizing the villagers. So he was out there trying to get rid of the scourge. It's evening time. As dusk, the shadows are a little longer, the forest seems a little darker and slightly scarier. There is an evening mist which makes everything looks ethereal in the soft light of the dusk. And he is galloping away, chasing the poor, when suddenly Harishchandra hears a cry of a woman in distress. Save me, it says, help me, please don't let them kill me. And Harishchandra abandons his search for the boar and then gallops towards the source of the sound. It seems to be the coming from a ticket over on this side and then he moves into the ticket, gallops a little faster, expertly going through the underbrush and the thick copse of the trees. The sound gets stronger and stronger so he knows that he is in the right direction. And then he emerges out into a clearing, some misty, grassy clearing. And the sound is even louder. And what does he see? There is no woman there. But yet the screams are coming. All he sees is a gigantic rock. And sitting on the rock is a yogi. He's sitting in Padmasana, full lotus pose. pose and he has his thumb and forefinger together in Jnana Mudra, the mudra of wisdom. His spine is erect. His scantily clad long flowing beards and matted locks. His eyes are half open, half closed. His fingernails are so long that it's obvious that the yogi is sitting completely unmoving, motionless for a ticket. Help me. Please don't let them kill me. The sound is coming from the inside his body. Unthinking, Harishchandra gallops his horse towards the rock, leaps from the horse in an expert pound and strides up nimbly up on the rock, stands next to the yogi and is ready to do the unthinkable. He is ready to disturb Rishi, a yogi, in deep meditation. That is never done. A yogi in meditation is as holy as the sunset or the sunrise. You watch it and you be sanctified by it. You never disturb it. But overcome by delusion and unable to tolerate the screams Harishchandra is about to do that, you see unbeknownst of him. The yogi is none other than the great Rishi Vishwamitra, the friend of the universe. The decade he was a God realized being and it was through him God used him as a channel to gift to humanity the greatest of all mantras the Gayatri Mantra. So he is well known.
about a decade ago, it was the divine will that Vishwamitra meditate in this very forest clearing and subdue the evil spirits that had inhabited that part of the forest for ages. So after 10 years of meditation, drawing his concentration inwards, increasing his energy by leaps and bounds, using his magnetism, Vishwamitra had drawn the evil spirits back into his spine. The gigantic inner conflict was taking place and the evil spirits are just about to be subdued just about to be subdued and they were making the noise help me please don't let them kill me harishchandra not knowing any of this is ready to do the unthinkable he stands over shamitra and shakes him from his meditation and as soon as he does that a decade's worth of concentration is broken his spine is demagnetized and the evil spirits happily escaped into the forest. Their evil presence is felt immediately. Harish Chandra feels it. The moment he shook Vishwamitra, he feels that something's changed. There is evil in the air. He knows he committed an unpardonable sin. Vishwamitra opens his eyes. They are blazing with anger. Who dares disturb my meditation? More importantly, who dares stand as an obstacle when I am doing the will of a god? Such as his anger that his emaciating frame is radiating power and vitality. His anger, the power of the universe, is ready to be harnessed and ready to burn Harishchandra into ashes right that moment. And Harishchandra is shaking with fear. He is he, he, a great virtuous king, but who can stand in front of the power of the God himself? Nobody can. Like a leaf stuck. In a wing storm, Harishchandra is shaking and he falls at Vishwamitra's feet, goes the feet and says, My Lord, please forgive me. I was only doing my duty. What am I to do? I am a Kshatriya, a warrior, a king, protector of the weak. When I hear the screams of a woman, I have to go protect her. Please forgive me, Lord. I was overcome by delusion. With a visible effort of will, that's unfathomable, Vishwamitra calms himself down. His blazing eyes regained their divine calmness. Harishchandra too has recovered and then Vishwamitra looks at Harishchandra and says, You have committed an unpardonable sin. Ignorance cannot be an excuse for it. Tell me, Harishchandra, what are you going to do to repent for your sin? Harishchandra looks at him calmly. Anything I have, my lord, anything is yours to take. Vishwamitra says, take caution in what you are promising. Really, is it anything that I have? And Harishchandra says, yes, my lord, I will remember this. And one of these days, I'll come and claim something from you, said Vishwamitra. And then Vishwamitra goes back to his meditation. Harishchandra goes back to his kingdom. A month pass and Harishchandra's court Court is in full session, he's the ruler of the entire earth. So his large ceremonial court hall on either side are representatives from vassal states from across the earth, and there are scholars, administrators, artisans, painters, singers, thousands of people, and Vishwamitra is sitting there conducting the business of the state. He's deeply encrossed into it. And while he's doing that, in straight the majestic emaciated blazing form of Vishwamitra. Harishchandra is holding court. In a loud voice, Vishwamitra demands, O king, I have come to accept my gift. For a moment, Harishchandra is stunned because he is deep in the midst of administering the earth and then he hurriedly gets up, recognizes who it is and then honors Vishwamitra the way uh, it is. He's, he was supposed to bring Simpam on the dais, has its throne of equal height next to him and says, what can I give you, my lord? Vishwamitra says, remember, you promised that you will give me anything that you are able to give. Yes, my lord. I said so. Happily, I'll give it to you. And Vishwamitra says, hear this, this is my demand and this shall absolve you of the unpardonable sin that you committed. You shall give me the entire earth with its lands, flowing rivers, trees, forests, 
ocean, deeps, vast fruitful plains, they shall all belong to me. All the animals, the singing birds, all of your citizens, they are now under my dominion. Very calmly, completely unmoved, Harishchandra says, Yes, my lord, it is all yours. Because he is Harishchandra, the truthful. He serves the truth and nothing else. Vishwamitra is not done. He says there is more. He says, I want all of your palaces, your chariots, elephants, horses, armies and arms. Yes, my lord. All of your gold coins, jewelry, wealth, they are all mine. Yes, sir. Great Rushi, they are all yours. He is not done yet. Your wardrobe, all the clothes that you wear, the fine silks and the bracelets, the rings, necklaces of not only you, but of Queen Shaiva and the Prince Rohita, they are all mine. Yes, my lord, but shall, what shall we wear? Only the coarsest of linens to cover your modesty and rough hewn slippers to walk in the forest. Yes, my lord, it's all yours. He's not done yet. What else is left to give? What else can a man give? He can give all of his past good karma. Can he? Can he not? It's called punya in Sanskrit. So Vishwamitra says, you shall give to me all of your past good karma. You will be preft of the fruits of every good deed, good thought, every charitable work that you did. Throughout all your lifetimes, they shall be mine. Vishwamitra stood for a moment. Such a gift has never been demanded, but it shall be given. For after all, is he not Harishchandra, the truthful, says, Yes, sir, that too shall be yours. Now, how are the gifts given back in those days? You just didn't write the check and you say, here you go. That wasn't how it was done. You see, giving of gift was a way of refining your own consciousness. So it had a ritual. The ritual was that you first honor the person you are gifting to. Because that's the person that's helping you purify your ego. And then you take a bit of holy water in your hands, invoke into it. The essence of the gift that you are about to give, imbue it with the power on the energy of that gift and offer that holy water to the person that's taking the gift. It's called Arkya. That's the name in Sanskrit. Even today, if you go to Rishikesh, next I mean, you go to Rishikesh, Haridwar, Kashi, any of the holy rivers in India, go there and sunrise and you will see people giving Arkya to the sun and saying Om Swaha. That means I offer myself to you, life-giving sun. They are gifting themselves to sun. That's what it means. That then the third part of the ritual is something called Dakshina. Dakshina means, say you just don't give a gift. You give a little sub-gift, a little supplementary gift with the main gift. It's as if, say you are giving a donation. You write a check and then you give a little piece of flour or a few fruits and then you offer the check. Have you seen that? That's Dakshina. Every gift has to be given with Dakshina. So, Harishchandra says, snaps his finger, a great golden ball is brought, and he washes Vishwasmitra's feet with the holy water of the Ganges river. And then, he takes a water pot, places water on it, holds it to its spiritual eyes, imagines all his possessions, over which he held dominion, until just now. He imagines his wife's, his child's possessions. He imagines all the good karma that he has done all, over all the lifetimes. Such was his grace that he could recall his lifetimes at that single moment. He imbued the holy water with all of that, offers it as it all care to Vishwamitra. Vishwamitra receives the water, drinks it and that's how the transfer was complete. That was the contract. And then whatever little is left, he sprinkles it on its crown chakra. And then it was done. And just like that, Harishchandra, the king emperor, becomes destitute. Save the empress, the queen, has nothing except the coarsest of linen to wear. And the little boy has to suffer hunger and strive at the rest of his life. 
but yet satyagraha the compelling power of the truth is such that devoid of all of his possessions which shaiva and rohita they all come the little boys in the middle and the father and the mother on either side they stride down from the great throne room instead of being diminished by their loss it somehow seems that their stature is enhanced by their sacrifice as they stride down the great palace somehow seems to have shrunk so big is their aura with head held high shoulders squared the royal family strides down opens the palace doors and goes out into the royal boulevard word has spread already lining on the isle's side are all the citizens of the capital city of the earth they are crying it's like losing their parents some of them are writhing on the floor because so great is their sorrow they are pulling on the clothes of harishchandra and saying why are you leaving us who are we without you you have made us orphans harishchandra too feels grief and and the citizens cannot hold themselves back when stays they see shaiva the queen walk out in coarse linen and they think the queen and the prince they always came in palanquins and behind them was entourage of elephants and servants and in front of them were horsemen and warriors and here she is walking our queen our mother they too harishchandra and his wife had grief stricken but the power of the truth upholds them and they walk resolutely they come to the city gates and as the gatekeepers are about to open the city they hear the voice of vishwamitra the yogi and the sage he who speaks with the voice of god they hear his voice and says o king have you not forgotten something vishwamitra turns back what i have forgotten lord i gave you everything i had you have forgotten the dakshina where is the smaller gift that you're supposed to give me sir i have nothing i have you saw me i have given you everything other than the clothes on my back i have nothing what can i give you i am happy to give you the clothes i have i can i am happy to give you the coarse rough hewn slippers that i am wearing i have nothing else to give vishwamitra says how can you give a great gift like that without a commensurate equivalent dakshina to go with it i hereby fix the dakshina to be 1000 gold coins if you don't give it to me you will be known forever as harishchandra the untruthful harishchandra the that broke his word dharmic man that he is harishchandra knows that vishwamitra is right it is his right to demand the dakshina that's what the dharma says he says oh if all gentlemen please give me one month i will somehow find the dakshina and then give it to you okay covid card fair the well may you not be disturbed by robbers or bandits on your way vishwamitra blesses him and sends him off harishchandra goes into the forest along orders generally who knows how many days it took but eventually they come out of the forest and by now they are dusty they are emaciated half the time they have been hungry and they have been only be foraging and eating whatever they could get brave though the king was warrior though he was what can he do without any weapons they are emaciated dust covered and they emerged into the celestial city of kashi banaras it is said that when brahma the creator created the earth he also created kashi you see every city in the world exists to celebrate life kashi is special it's created by shiva the destroyer and it celebrates death in a regular city you have granaries you have palaces you have marriage halls and you have schools and that's how it should be because it perpetuates and celebrates life in kashi you have cremation grounds and temples dedicated to lord shiva and that's it
it's the only city it's called the eternal city and it celebrates death it gives an opportunity for everybody to come there to renounce everything they have and embrace death with open arms and thereby feel the presence of god behind the finiteness of life they feel the infinite presence of god only by boldly embracing the death in kashi corpses they don't put makeup on corpses and tell them uphold them for viewing they take corpse just the way it was when it was died embrace the death and burn it in a funeral prior it happens even today it's been happening for thousands of and thousands of years the city is filled with the chant of the great five syllable mantra om namah shivaya and uh, as uh, harish chandra emerges from the forest to the rising sun he hears the chant of om namah shivaya all around him resonant Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya He gazes at the rising sun He suddenly sees a little ball of light that detaches itself from the orb of the sun He is seeing it across the Ganges river the ball of light detaches itself raises towards him in the sky becoming brighter and brighter almost overwhelmingly blindingly bright and then lands in front of him and the diffuse form arranges itself coalesces into vishwamitra the sage the yogi the vishwamitra says harishandra where is my dakshina today is your 30 days 30 days are up and harishandra says oh effulgent one we have been in the forest all these days technically the day is not over until dusk so please give me until dusk i will give you your 1000 gold coins vishwamitra looks at him sternly he says i will be back now harishandra is desperate he goes to the market square then and he stands on a tall platform this is where all businesses are conducted in the city of that and he says i am ready to work I am very capable and very qualified in many 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 skills. Please somebody give me work. He says, "I am a warrior. I know swordsmanship. I am an archer." And they look at him. He's matted locks, he's dust covered, he's wearing coarse linen and he's stooped and they laughed at him. "What kind of a warrior are you? You can't even kill a mosquito," they say. And this goes on for a little bit. nobody buys him harishandra gets even more desperate by now it's noon the harsh noon day sun of central india is beating down on him he's getting desperate and he says i will sell myself i will serve whoever my master is whoever buys me i will serve him for the rest of my life will somebody not buy me nobody nobody comes forward harishandra is now desperate he's dejected he's hungry he's aware that his wife and child are hungry too what does he do harish chandra the truthful the virtuous king emperor of the earth gives up says i'm done he comes down the platform goes to his wife shaivya and says my beloved I cannot give the dakshina there is no way I can get 1000 gold coins when vishwamitra comes in the evening I'll admit my defeat but don't worry I'll make sure that his curse only falls on me after all your only mistake was to be with, to be married to a wretch like me nothing will happen to you now shaivya who is normally very gentle soft spoken and compassionate her face hardens and she looks at him and in a strong voice she says forsake your grief o king forsake your weakness what are you saying a man that doesn't stick to his word is worse than the vilest of the criminal he will rot in purgatory for eternity 
after having committed acts of charity and piety all your life why do you want to give it all up and lose your place in the heavens just because of a moment of weakness she says i have only one desire that my husband be celebrated as harish chandra the truthful not harish chandra the liar and this turns harish chandra back and he sees what his goal in life should be and then shaiva is about to say something something else but then she breaks down and starts weeping she is unable to say now harish chandra is see his momentarily delusion is gone so he's hold his wife face in both of his hands and he says what is it my beloved what do you want to tell me whatever it is you are my better half you keep me please keep tell me whatever that is i listen to you she says my lord i have been so lucky to be married to you every desire of mine has been fulfilled i have been so blessed i have born you a great virtuous son i have only one more desire and that is to see that harish chandra is celebrated as being committed to the truth will you please now her voice cracks as she says she says will you please sell me i can be a maid for the rest of my life there are many rich brahmins in the city of the dead they'll need my services i can take care of somebody's household harish chandra is grief stricken he doesn't know what to do what what can he do but that is the way of the truth that is the power of the truth that's what the truth demands of him so he reluctantly agrees goes back on the platform and asks if there are any buyers for his wife and son and the brahmin comes he says i will pay you 500 gold coins for your wife and 250 for your son and so it was the king emperor of the hub the uh, earth being committed to truth was forced to sell his wife and his son into eternal servitude into the house of a brahmin but now remember i said truth has its own compelling power that compelling power forms a shield around him that even though he was forced to do these things and he, though shaivya was forced to commit herself to servitude the power of the truth keeps him calm peaceful they see beyond the trajectory of whatever is happening right now and so even in this most grief stricken moment they are calm they look at each other one last time eyes brimming with tears heart swimming in an ocean of grief with this one last look they have the communication of their lifetime and then they turn away from each other shaiva and rohita walk behind the brahman into their new life of servitude without even looking harishchandra holds the bag of 750 gold coins vishwamitra appears takes it by now it's 3 pm and he says three more hours you owe me 250 gold coins more and he vanishes now harish chandra goes back onto the platform he's filled with the new resolve he hears the words of his wife that the man who lies is the wildest of the wild his words and the worst criminal he says i shall never lie i shall stick to my word so he goes back on the platform and he says somebody please buy me i'll promise i, I will serve you to the best of my ability for the rest of my natural life i will even live as long as i can so that you shall not be deprived of my service this is my promise to you by now a great crowd has gathered because they they have seen the strange man claiming to be a warrior claiming to know all kinds of things yet looking like a emaciated buffoon and at the same time they have seen him sell his wife so they are enjoying his misery shed and frida it's called so a large crowd has gathered <sighs> harish chandra ask one more time it's almost dusk and from behind the crowd comes a harsh 
frightful, grating voice. And the voice says, I will buy you. And the crowd cleaves as if moved apart by an invisible force. And from in between the crowd comes a frightful looking giant of a man. He's huge, over seven feet tall, a big belly, rotting teeth, foul smelling. He has a garland of bones around his neck and he has a skull in his hand. He has a blanket draped over his shoulders infested with bugs and insects. And the crow is flying around him, frenzied, making crow-like noises. The crowd whispers, Pravira, it says. And Pravira says one more time in his frightening voice, I will buy you. In the city of the dead, even death is not feared as much as Pravira is. He is the keeper of the crematorium grounds, of all the crematorium grounds in the celestial city of Kashi. He has the horrible job of collecting a bag of rice and a little money from the weeping relatives of dead people as they come to get themselves cremated. And people adore their bodies with a fine piece of clothing as a mark of respect just before lighting them on fire. Pravira has the wild job of taking that cloth and keeping it from for himself. The crowd wants nothing to do with it. In his ears, Harishandra hears a voice in his left ear of Vishwamitra. Vishwamitra using his yogi powers, he's speaking in, with his inner voice. Vish, Vishwamitra says, my son Harishandra, don't do this. The fact that you are even thinking about doing this is enough of your commitment of a demonstration of your commitment to truth. I absolve you from the other 250 gold coins that you are about to give me. Spending one minute with Pravira, he will give you such bad karma that you will burn in purgatory for hundreds of years. Don't do this. In his right ears, Harishchandra hears the voice of his wife. All that a man has is his word. If he is known as a liar, he is worse than the wildest of the criminals. So speaking with the voice of his heart, replying to his voice in left ear, Harishchandra says, No sir, I didn't give you my word. I gave my word to the universe. It's dynamic truth. Truth is not fact. I can't withdraw it merely because I don't like a job. What does that make me? If it means I rot in hell for eternity, so be it. I will gladly take it before being branded as a liar. So boldly, he strides down the platform and goes to Pravira, holds out his hand for 250 gold coins, takes that, holds it to the side, Vishwamitra appears and takes his gold coins and silently blesses him saying, your death is not finished. And Harishchandra leans down in front of Pravira, the crematorium keeper and says, I shall serve the Lord. You are my God from this point on. Your wish is my command. The rotting piece of blanket that Pravira had on his shoulder, which was recently draped over a dead body. He takes that blanket and drapes it over Harishchandra as a symbol of his eternal servitude. Despite all of this, even in this most horrible of choices, Harishchandra is saying, the home I see is dark and my stars are gone. I still see the light of truth because of God's mercy. I have made the pole star of my life, he says. And as he gets up and begins to walk behind Pravira, the Lord Emperor of the Earth, 
has only one pole star, which is the truth. And he walks to his new duties as the keeper of a crematorium. As he walks, he continues into the crematorium and Pravira shows him his hut and he says, this is where you reside from now on. And your job is to collect money and the bag of rice and from there, a sixth of it goes to the king. And the rest of it, a third of it rest goes to me and you can keep the rest of it. And so begins the new life of Vishwamitra, of Harishchandra. But he has a pole star and he keeps singing to himself. Harishandra not sits not on his throne, not attending business of states, but he sits in front of the funeral pyres in the city of dead. It's not something that runs from nine to six; it runs twenty-four hours. Where deaths doesn't come during business hours, does it? It comes at all times. So people are streaming in day and night, and Harishandra dutifully goes gets the bag of rice and a little bit of money, turns them away if they are unable to pay it because such is his job. His duty is now only to his master. That too is the service of truth. You cannot be, you cannot pick and choose the truth that applies to you. Truth is one and eternal as it says. So he continues his job. But even then, he is undisturbed. There is a calm that settles over him. Because he has made the ultimate sacrifice of the truth and he faces death. He sees change in front of him day and night. There are young children who died who are not supposed to die and people struck down in the prime of their life and there are old people that have lived well beyond the prime of their lives. Day after day he sees the impermanence of life. Because of the atmosphere and because of sitting in front of the funeral pyres, the funeral fire every day, his skin shrivels, his eyes become darker and lose their luster it seems, but there is an unearthly peace within him, it feels like God is right there, all he needs to do is close his eyes, beyond the miasma of death he sees the permanence of the soul. And here it was that Harishchandra was found the peace that he was unable to find when being the emperor of earth he was unable to find with all his wealth in the city of the dead attending to the final macabre needs of corp corpses sticking to the truth above all else Satyagraha he finds Satchidananda here in the cremation ground and so this goes on he loses track of time destiny is still not done with this great king one day it's about 3 a.m and the crematorium doors there is a knocking he goes and opens it there is a shelf old looking woman she's discolored and absent-minded her eyes are darkened and overcome with grief she's it's obvious and she's holding the corpse of a small child in her hands and she says sir my child just died because he was bitten by a cobra the venom was so potent that it killed him in minutes I need to cremate him right away because that's what scriptures say for him to have an astral ascension will you not like the light the funeral fire and Harishchandra says do you have the bag of rice? Do you have the money? No, sir, I don't. Then I'm sorry, dear. Blessed lady, I can't let you. Then as he says that, he looks at the boy. Why is my heart racing? He asks himself. 
and there it is unmistakable and the boy's forehead the birthmark of the prince of the realm it is his son rohita and he looks at the woman once again this disheveled discolored almost mad with grief woman is none other than his beautiful wife shavya and in this moment she too recognizes him they come into each other's arms consoling each other losing a child such an unnatural thing to happen under these circumstances helpless as they both are and then shavya says will you not cream at your own son harish chandra says you know the answer to that i cannot be untruthful my master has said that i need a bag of rice and some money until then i cannot light the fire you have it he makes his heart turn into a stone and she knows she knows the power of truth and his commitment to it she too has made the ultimate sacrifice so she too has powers in her powers that she didn't know until that moment so reaching deep inside she manifests a wall of fire right in front of her and she says my beloved husband yes i understand you cannot create the funeral fire without me giving you a bag of rice and money however i have created it let all three of us enter into the fire and let's be reunited in the astral realm as the family that we once were happily harish chandra walks with her into the fire what a great solution but in the last moment he stops he lets go of her hand and says my beloved wife i cannot do that because he remembers his promise he made on the platform he said i will live as long as i can possibly because i will serve you so he says i cannot do that the wife looks at him she knows by now it is god that is moving her celestial husband words are being spoken which will be remembered for ages to come so she looks at him walks into the fire along with her son harish chandra looks calmly on as the tongues of flame become bigger and brighter and hotter and begin to engulf the queen of the earth and the prince of the realm and then suddenly in an instant the fire disappears there is an unearthly glow in the skies and descending from the skies in the golden chariot is indra the king of gods a thousand divine voices sing glory be to harish chandra and glory glory be to shaivya and the king of gods he is resplendent in the finest of silks ethereal they seem so fine they are gem studded crown in aura of divine light surrounds him so uplifting his presence that in this cremation ground flowers begin to bloom at his very appearance the smell of charred corpses and burning flesh is replaced by the fragrance of roses and lilies indra the king of gods comes down walks up to harishchandra and says o king your test is over it was the divine will that the gods test you your commitment to truth because as the lower ages are coming there is need for a pole star for people to follow her they cannot go in and out of truth as they want and so you were picked by brahman himself to be tested in this way and you passed with flying colors indra says harish chandra looks at him and says lord for your test did you have to take the life of my innocent child what has he done and indra smiles at him so dazzlingly harish chandra in surprise this smile is so discordant even what he said that harish chandra looks back at where rohita's corpse was supposed to be and there instead of corpse is the boy all healthy and he runs up to his father hugs his legs and harish chandra scoops him up like a man in the desert scooping up water
and drinks in the fragrance of his son muscles his neck holds him never to let him go shaiva runs up to her husband and her son they all hold each other a soft voice of vishwamitra interrupts this reunion and he says forgive me king for testing you so harshly but such was the will of brahma i had to do it he takes his water pot pours the water in it invokes all of harishchandra's possessions and he says hold out your hand king i am going to give your dominion back to you what does harishchandra say he says no sir effulgent but i cannot accept it do you not remember the promise i made on the platform i am indebted i am in servitude to provider of the cremation grounds keeper and my wife and son are in servitude to the brahmin just because i did there is no clause in there which says you saw me until you become a king i have to serve them i don't want my kingdom the heavens are stunned and provira walks up to him except he is no longer this horrifying scary man he is the god of dharma god of dharma is the divine accountant he is the one that's patiently taking note of all your good and bad deeds and he says i am the god of dharma and therefore i have erased your servitude to me and brahmin too is one of the devas i have erased your wife and son's servitude to them accept accept the kingdom and this was the final test and because of this final test you have now achieved something that no man has achieved before and perhaps no one else will will ever will you have earned the right the weight of your karma is good karma is so great that you have now earned the right to ascend into the heavens in your mortal frame come the golden chariot awaits you and the gods are singing glory be to harishchandra glory be to shail such a commitment to truth has never been seen before harishchandra says no no sir, i can't do this indra is saying no the test is really over there is it it's really no more tricks to this it this is what brahman asks us to do we we are really done come to heaven harishchandra's commitment to truth is so great that it's even transcended the morality of astral beings says i cannot do that when i was born here into this earth into this incarnation my job my dharma my karma was to take care of my subjects i was meant to protect the weak and to dispense justice and rule my kingdom justly and compassionately i cannot if if i ascend to heavens will take care of my kingdom and he said you said i have this great karma and you said shiv and rohita have this great karma to ascend into heavens he looks at god of dharma the divine accountant and he says do you not have the power to distribute my good karma among all the citizens of earth everybody stunned they even the gods are unable to comprehend the extraordinary morality that is implied in this it truly is the gospel for a new age they say they feel the presence of brahman himself lauding harishchandra's commitment to truth and so indra says that has to so be it your good karma is distributed among the citizens of the earth and earth will be prosperous and dharmic like never before and so it was that harishchandra goes back to his kingdom rules his kingdom for many hundreds of years and then attains liberation 
and the king of gods declares that there has never been seen one as truthful as harish chandra from now on for as long as the sun and the moon exist you shall be known as satya harish chandra harish chandra the truthful it is not enough to pick and choose your truth you have to commit to truth with such single minded focus that lord eventually becomes your declares to the lord i am dying lord lord i am dying be thou mine i will commit to truth and so it was that for thousands of years harishchandra's story has been recalled in such sanghas in gatherings in india just like this and may we too like harishchandra be blessed by the gift of truth सत्यम परम धीमहि जय गुरुदेव